Hello, everybody. Welcome. I want to talk to you today uh, on a theme of finishing well on this topic. Four stages of leadership that lead to finishing well. Four stages of leadership that lead to finishing well. Uh, there are four stages of leadership that one must successfully navigate if he or she would finish well as a leader. And before we address some important principles for finishing well, I want to discuss these four stages of leadership that every leader must navigate through your life and ministry if you're going to end it well significantly or successfully. Now, the, the first stage is to become a leader people can honestly follow. And that doesn't just happen overnight. That takes a lifetime of work. Now, this is the building stage. Come with me to the board for just a minute. This this is the building stage, the self-building stage, self-building stage. Self-building stage. You're building yourself as a leader every day that you live and work. It involves being the best that you can be for God and those whom you are working with and leading. Use uh, 2 Timothy as your playbook. It has so much practical advice for a leader. Paul was trying to cram in this last book that he wrote, he was trying to cram all of the leadership principles that he knew and could into the man to whom he had bequeathed the bulk of his ministry, Timothy. He had given him the great church at Ephesus, which was the engine of first century Christianity. He had made him superintendent, bishop overseer, of all of Asia Minor, which comprised 90% of the ministry that Paul built and the first century church represented. So use that book. Fill your life up with these, these principles because at the end of that, Paul could say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith so that they, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Now, in order to fulfill this stage of our ministry, uh, we... We must self-build, as I said. We must come to an understanding of ministry and people. In other words, it becomes a lifestyle for us. We will also pick up authority as we mature in our own spiritual father's house. It's not our house yet. It's, it's another's house. It's not our ministry yet. It's another's ministry. For we have, we have come into leadership underneath the guiding hand of our own spiritual father. And it's in this house and 
by that leader that we will gain authority as an elder. Now, being an elder means that you have been accepted into a five-fold ministry. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. That's eldership. Underneath elders are deacons. Deacons are congregational leaders who have expertise and excellence and enthusiasm in a particular part of the ongoing life of the body, the church. And so they serve the body, basically on a horizontal level. But an elder, an elder is not a deacon. An elder then becomes a vertical ministry. This is a ministry of, well, the, the word presbyteros literally means to steer the ship. So you see, you are beckoned by the captain of the ship, your spiritual father, your senior pastor, your apostolic leader. You are beckoned by him into shared leadership with him and given the authority then of eldership. You see? It's a process. A process. It's a process of building. You're building the man of God. You're becoming the man of God that God wishes to have you be so that he can give you your life assignment. Now, that's a very, very important stage. Most Christians don't reach this stage. The Bible says a child, as long as he is a child, whether he's a newborn child, whether he is a child who has learned the principles of the kingdom, or whether he is a son in his father's house, is still a child. See, the step that is back here before being a leader is the step of being a son, a spiritual son. We, we literally start there. But I'm not dealing with that part of this today. I'm dealing with the leader. And so you come out of sonship and self-build into the man of God that he wants you to be. That involves an understanding of ministry and of life in general, of the word of God, of the body of Christ, and then being elevated by someone else into spiritual authority, which we call eldership. And one of these five-fold ministries will be dominant in your life. Either you'll be raised up in, as a teacher, a pastor, an evangelist, a prophet, or perhaps even an emerging apostle. Now, the second stage, this is stage number one. Second stage that we must pass through if we would finish well as leaders is the stage of father. That means primarily this. The second stage is to develop other leaders who can produce a third generation of leaders. And this is the fathering stage. This is the leadership stage. This is then the fathering stage. What, what has happened from here? Well, you are beginning to build not just a ministry, but a family. Not your own ministry, but now a family. Other people are coming underneath you. Other people are saying, I want to be one of your sons and one of your daughters. I want to have your DNA and your leadership and your wisdom inside of me 
Can I become a part of your family? Now, this is vitally important. There is a world of difference between being a man of God and a father, a spiritual father. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 in the New King James gives uh, the, the key to this. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, it's so important, I'm going to write it here. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And here's what it says. The things that you have heard from me among many witnesses... Commit these to faithful leaders who will teach them to others also. So what you have begun to do now is not just build ministry, but you now have, have begun to father the next generation. Few leaders excel here because they want to do all the preaching. They want to do all the teaching and all the praying, and they want to get all the glory and all the money that comes from ministry. But a mature adult spiritual father focuses on his spiritual sons and daughters. It's very interesting to me that a person who is in this stage of life, the Bible calls him a huios, H-U-I-O-S, a huios. That is a son of God, meaning not a child, not a child, but a man of God. This person here is capable of reproduction, but he's not reproducing yet. He's building and learning He's wedding. He's bringing himself into a place to become a father, but he's not yet a father. When he becomes a spiritual father, he moves into stage number two. These are all the stages. Stage one is stage two. He moves into this stage. And on this stage, he begins to focus on raising the family of God. And he does it by what I call the four R's. The four R's. Number one, he recognizes spiritual sons and daughters in the making. He sees them in the nest, as it were. He begins to find what I've called the eagles in the nest. There are all kinds of birds in the nest of the church. Some of them are beautiful sparrows, and they can sing, and they create joy and beauty around you. But that's about the extent of their value, is creating pleasure and joy. These are children of God. They're in the body of Christ. You can't get them to soar high. You can't get them uh, to fly long. They really have to be nurtured and taken care of. There are some buzzards in there too. <laughs> People who are always looking for carrion and always looking at the pessimistic side of things. You have to learn to deal with all of these. But there are some eagles in the nest. And these eagles you want to focus on. And you want to raise them up into men and women of God. See, There's a difference. You've moved now from the stage of just being a leader to the stage of being a father leader. So you recognize them. Then you raise them up. You do whatever it takes to make them better. Then you release them. You release them not into your task for them, but into their task for God. 
You find out what it is that they are strong in, they are excellent at, and you feed their strengths, and help them minimize their weaknesses, but feed their strengths, and you build them up into their best self. And then you release them, give them opportunities to soar, to be the eagles that they are, no longer just sparrows in the nest. And then you resource them along the way to make them the best that they can be. Now, you see, you have moved now from ministry to family. You now are a father in the faith. That's stage number two. Stage number three. Stage number three. Very, very interesting. Is what the Bible calls the patriarch stage, which is a very simple word. It's a father, of course, patri, patros, that's father, but father of strength, father of extended authority. Arkos is the Greek word for power. So a father of power. Father of power. Now, let's talk about this third stage for just a bit. The third stage is to allow your leaders to lead so that they can develop their own third generation of leaders and fathers. Do you see what I'm saying here? Come on back. Come on back to the, to the board with me for just a minute. When you, you will know when you have moved from stage two to stage three, when not only sons and daughters come to you, but now fathers themselves come to you. And when these fathers come to you, spiritual fathers who have sons and daughters under them, when they come to you, they bring their sons and daughters with them. So there's a family, there's a family, and there's another family. All of a sudden, you don't have just a family now. You have a clan. You have a clan. This is the patriarchal stage of leader. Now, Jethro, I want, I want you to look at Exodus 18, and particularly we're going to focus on verse 21, which I believe is the greatest sentence on leadership I have ever read. Exodus 18, verse 21. Moses, you remember, God had brought the Hebrews out of Egypt and into the wilderness en route to the promised land. Actually, they were going to stop at Sinai and become the people of God. But they weren't yet an organized people of God. There were a lot of families running around each with its own head, doing things in their own ways. And all of them were trying to come to Moses and treat him like their spiritual father. Well, he couldn't be the spiritual father to the whole group unless he found a way to turn that family into a clan. And it was Jethro, his father-in-law, who took him from the father stage to the patriarch stage. And he did it with this one principle in Exodus 18, 21. If you've got a Bible, open it up and let's take a look at it. It is incredible. Now I'm going to move off of this for just a moment until uh, I can... Uh, uh, 
take us into this magnificent verse, and then I want to return to this again. So could we move over from this and uh, exactly, and then I'll come back to it in just a moment. All right, Exodus 18, 21. Look, look at the wisdom in this thing. The people, as you know, were coming to Moses from sunup until sundown, and everybody brought his problem to Moses because he was the lawgiver. He was, he was the father. Well, some would have massive problems that involved hundreds, maybe thousands of people. Others would have tiny problems that would involve just themselves or themselves and a spouse or themselves and a child. Well, Moses couldn't handle all of that. And Jethro made the statement, you're going to drive yourself crazy and you're going to frustrate everybody in your kingdom. So here's what he said. He said, thou shalt, I want, I want you to see this, thou shalt do four things. Four things. He said, number one, teach the people the ordinances. That, that's the King James word. And mo most of the translations pick it up. The Hebrew word for it is C-H-O-Q. Hok. There it is right there. O and Hok. Hok. C-H-O-Q. C-H-O-Q. Now, and then he says, teach them the ordinances and teach them the laws. Teach them the laws. All right. Now the word laws, we know this word. It's the word Torah. T-O-R-A-H. Torah. And then he says, and show them the way. Show them the way. Show them the way. Now, hold on, hold on. And that's this Hebrew word derek, D-E-R-E-K, derek. And then the way that they must walk, the way to walk. I'm going to put the word walk right here, the way to walk. And then, and show them. Some things you teach, other things you demonstrate. You understand? Some things you teach rationally with words, other things you demonstrate with actions. And show them the work that they must do. Show them the work that they must do. And that word is the word asa. Now, watch this. I have never read in any leadership book greater wisdom than this. Jethro comes to Moses and he says, Moses, here's what I want you to do. You have got to teach the people the ordinances. Now, what is an ordinance? Another word for it is statute. Statutes. Well, here's your constitution bylaws, ladies and gentlemen. Here's your, here's your operational documents. Here's the handbook, the manual of operations. He says you've got to have a system in which you can work in an orderly fashion. Now the word hok here, hok. You know what the word literally is the great word hokma is the great word for wisdom. It's the book of wisdom. This is your Bible. <laughs> this is your operations documents. He says teach the people Give 
give them a, a sense of belonging to something that is ordered and orderly, that has meaning and purpose. You have to make them into a team if you're going to lead them effectively. They can't remain individuals and they can't remain split up into different families with different loyalties, tribal loyalties. They've got to come into becoming a nation, becoming a people. That's, that's what this is all about. Make your people a part of the church, the people a part of the country, a people a part of the movement, depending on what kind of leader you are. This is, hok is the root word of chokmah, which is the greatest word for wisdom in the Bible. And he says, and you must then teach them also the Torah, the laws, the Torah. And Torah means the way to walk, the way to walk. Now, I know I've got word walk here, but watch it, watch it. The way to walk. The word Torah is the good life. It is the things that are required in order to truly be a part of this church, this ministry, this organization, so that they, they, they know <coughs> that certain behavior is required if they're going to be a loyal, living member of this ministry and this work of God. Isn't that incredible? Torah. This is not rules and regulations here, laws, rules and regulations. They, they don't work. But this is the manner of behavior, the manner of people that we truly are. If you want to be in tr truly a part of what this is all about, this is our lifestyle. That's the word for it, lifestyle. This is lifestyle. We don't regulate everything that you say and think and do, but we do anticipate a certain lifestyle. And then you go from teaching now to showing, to demonstrating the way they must walk. Now, this makes the Torah personal. This is personal and individual. You see, everybody has an individual anointing, an individual calling, <coughs> an individual way to walk. God has not called us all to be cookie-cut Christians. He, we're all individuals. We're all unique. And I have an anointing, and you have an anointing. And those are complementary, not identical. So, if you accept your place in what God is doing here, and you focus on living the lifestyle of what God is doing here, then you will find your place, and we're here to help you do that, of personal, individual anointing, so that you can happily make your contribution to the whole. And now, now look, and also show them the work that they must do. Every one of them has a task to perform, has a ministry to fulfill. When Jesus hung on the cross, 
You remember he cried out, it is finished. Jesus spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, a dialect of Hebrew. He didn't speak Greek. He didn't speak English. He didn't speak Latin. He spoke Aramaic, a dialect of Hebrew. And the word finished, which means completed, Done according to pattern is what Jesus culminated his own life with. Asa, he said. I have finished the work which you called me to do. <coughs> Each person then will find his individual fulfillment, find his own assignment, and be a part then of the whole. Now, is that a leadership passage or what? <coughs> it's the greatest one I have ever read in my life. Here Jethro helped his son Moses move from being a father to being a patriarch because he made Moses able to help his spiritual sons create their own families and lead them as they were able. Now, isn't that incredible? Now, I want to go back to the final stage, the fourth stage, stage number four. Here we are, stage number four. That's perfectly good. This stage occurs during the final two or three decades of life and maybe in just the final few years of life. Uh, this is to concentrate on being a father to fathers. You will then have patriarchs you will have leaders of clans that will come to you. And they will bring fathers with their families who have their ministries. And you see what's happening now? Your influence now is permeating and pervading not just scores or hundreds, but now perhaps thousands of people. And here you have become what Paul was and what Moses was. You have become a chief apostle. Now, what you're doing at this stage is concentrating on being a father to leaders who oversee networks and movements, who oversee leaders of leaders. And what you are building at this stage, whether it's a tight or a loose tribe, but it is a tribe made up of clans, made up of families, made up of the leadership of men and women of God. Now, let me say that very few people reach this stage. Paul did, Moses did, others in the scriptures did, and we have some folks today who can be called chief apostles. These are superintendents, bishops, overseers who have patriarchal fathers looking to them for guidance and direction. This is the leadership stage to which we can all aspire. Very few among us will ever attain to this. But 
these four stages need to be uh, gone through by all of us uh, who call ourselves leaders. Now, a great many of God's most successful people may never go beyond this stage. What a wonderful way to spend your life. You're an elder in the body of Christ. You find yourself under a spiritual father and you fulfill your ministry of perhaps evangelist, pastor, teacher, in the ministry of a spiritual father to yourself. Maybe even a patriarch or a chief apostle. What a great calling and accomplishment for one's life. But by the same token, then you may be called upon by God to become a spiritual father. And build your own family. If so, then be certain that you look to this great passage in 2 Timothy 2 2 and build on the basis of the four R's of recognizing, raising up, releasing, and then resourcing your spiritual fathers and sons. It'll mean a change of life, more of a focus on them than on the big crowds. But let me tell you, it will be worth it in the long run of things. There are many who have come to this stage, and this is a great stage to be in. It's the stage of being a patriarch, where you father fathers and bring them so that they can cross-pollinate each other, enrich each other's lives and ministries and the kingdom of God in the process. And then maybe some, some will be able to move into chief apostleship. You see the stages that I am, I am talking about. Now, These four stages are stages that we must be aware of and move into as God guides us. Now, if you remain as a fourfold elder and not an apostle, your life is so rich and full. And you don't need to worry about these other stages because your stage will be wrapped up in your ministry as a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, or a teacher. But if God has called you into apostolic ministry, be aware that these four stages will in some measure characterize your life and work. I hope that this has been uh, an eye-opener and a blessing to you, uh, as it was to me when I came upon these teachings. God bless you. I'm going to leave these with you now. I'll see you next time. This has been brought to you by Ron Cottle Ministries. For more information, please call us at 706 706- 256-0100 extension 217 or visit our website ronconnellministries.com